Welcome to News Inside. I'm An Xiang Hyun. We're joined by our panelists once again. Let's welcome back Professor Shin Sang Yap from Kyung University Graduate School of International Studies. And also Dr. Pong Young Shik from Asan Institute for Policy Studies. Welcome back. Now here's a look at our first topic of discussion. Sushiro만나서현안문제들에대해서심도있는논의를하고점검을하는그런회의를갖기를상당의의견들을얘기하고조정하도록해보겠다는의지이것은의미가있는진전이었다고보겠습니다외교안보문제에대해서상당간의정
And it is a very urgent situation, uh, especially for South Korean economy. Uh, the OECD just uh, published a new report that uh, forecasts uh, the annual growth rate of South Korean economy next year will be about 2.7 percent, which is lower than uh, previous prediction uh, at 3.0 uh, percent. Mm -hmm. And two years ago, actually, OECD forecasted that South Korean economic annual growth in uh, 2017 next year would be 3.6 percent. So it's a very uh, a big change, casting very gloomy prospect uh, for the future of South Korean economy. So it is very important for the government to uh, have uh, reliable uh, key members in the new cabinet uh, who will uh, be able to read the resolve and the direction mm. of the president's office and carry out the uh, agendas uh, without uh, any hesitation. Mm. Yes, it does look like uh, the uh, reshuffle mm. um, put a lot of emphasis on the economic mm -hmm. team. Uh, the size mm -hmm. of the reshuffle was mm -hmm. relatively small. Mm -hmm. How much of a difference do you think the new team will make, though? The basically, we cannot expect the big changes uh, considering the uh, reshuffle of the presidential uh, secretariats. As we know very well, the, uh, the former senior economic advisor to the president uh, Mr. An Jong Bom, he got a new post. Uh, he is in charge of the policy uh, the planning division, which is a senior position uh, at the uh, secretariat, and he will decide the policy direction uh, of this government. And uh, he also take the coordinating role uh, of the policy coordinating role, which will be suggested by the many ministries. So this is a very important position. But he will also be deeply involving in. Uh, the uh, economic policies as well. And the new uh, the, uh, economic advisor, I mean, the presidential, at the presidential office is the Mr. Kang So Kun. He was the former uh, professor teaching at economics at university. But uh, he was also our, the member of the ruling party. And before he became a member of parliament, he was also uh, a, a member of some advisory uh, the uh, team for uh, the Congresswoman Park Geun Hye. Mm -hmm. I mean, before she was elected as president. So uh, Park, I mean, Kang So Kun and then An Jong Bon, both of them were members of a kind of advisory uh, committee for the Congresswoman Park Geun Hye for a long time. So they have worked together. They have shared some common opinions about the uh, policy. Uh, economic policies for over the last several years. So considering uh, the job, I mean, discussion which they, they took, and considering the background, and considering their personal relations with Park Geun Hye, definitely, uh, th I think the, uh, there will be no uh, big changes in the economic policy, I think. Mm. Now, the politicians and uh, Cheong Wan promised uh, cooperation, but the first stumbling block uh, towards that came in the form of the song, March for the Beloved. Uh, in the end, the Ministry of Patriots and Veterans Affairs uh, decided to uphold the current practice of having a choir sing the song rather than having it sung by everyone attending Right. the commemorative event for the May 18th Democratic Movement. But why is there such a heated debate over how this song is sung? Because it's not just a song. It carries a very uh, sim important symbolic value uh, in the minds of Korean people uh, for the, uh, their effort to achieve uh, democratization in the 1980s. Uh, the song represents the pro-democracy movement in the 1980s against the, uh, the very harsh uh, authoritarian uh, government practices. And there is uh, so much to celebrate uh, what was achieved, not only by the uh, participants of the democratic movement, but also uh, members of the then government who accepted the demand from the people uh, for a more full-fledged uh, liberal democracy uh, in South Korea. The practice to uh, designate the song, uh, singing the song as a chorus uh, has been uh, consistent in practice since 2009. So not everyone attending the ceremony is obligated to mm. uh, sing the song uh, along the, uh, the choir. Mm -hmm. uh, that it has a very important but sensitive political implications that uh, the ceremony will be televised nationwide then if some political members are spotted not really singing along uh, the song in commemoration of the pro-democracy movement then uh, it will be uh, very, uh, some serious uh, damage for their political image. 
Um, so uh, President Park Geun-hye uh, attended the ceremony in 2013, and uh, President herself uh, was standing up while the sing was sung uh, by the chorus and the waving national flag. So she uh, paid the, uh, due respect uh, to the spirit uh, of the pro-democracy movement. Without actually singing. Without, without, without actually mm. singing. So it's a very delicate balance mm. about how to commemorate the fruit of a pro-democracy movement. The uh, opposition party floor leader, Mr. Wu sang expressed uh, a great deal of disappointment that uh, the first button was not uh, put in, uh, properly. So uh, blue, uh, the president's office needed to, uh, needs to show uh, some additional measures to restore the basic trust uh, between the administrative body of the government and the you know, opposition parties. So what is regretful is that um, the spirit of cooperation and harmony between uh, the president's office and political parties would need to create a kind of a virtuous cycle that experiencing some small initial successes of working together on some agenda that may not be very urgent and important, but by experiencing early success of cooperation, that would help create kind of culture of trust, putting trust in each other and this incident was very unfortunate in this regard. Mm. Although um, Chang Wade says it had no say in the ministry's decision. Right. Mm. Well, the ministry's point of view was that uh, it should be left up to the individual right. whether to sing along or not, right? Mm. Now, the final plenary session of the 19th National Assembly was held yesterday, yes. and it came to a close with nearly 10,000 bills still mm. on the table. table. Yeah, those bills are likely to be scrapped now, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, when you look at the how many are uh, bills out of total submitted uh, ones uh, were passed at the uh, 19th the National Assembly, we can guess how uh, unpredict I mean, the productivity of the uh, 19th the National Assembly was uh, low comparing with previous National Assemblies. Uh, if I give you the data, at the uh, 17th National Assembly, the, uh, the, the percentage was about 57.9%. And at the 18th the National Assembly, even though it was a little bit late, but still the percentage was about 54.7%. And how about the percentages at the 19th National Assembly? It was about 43.3%. Mm. So uh, uh, as we may heard many times already, at the 19th Nation, uh, National Assembly, the least number of the bills uh, were adopted. Uh, at the uh, National Assembly. Less Partic than half. Less than half, mm. yes. That's the, uh, particularly um, uh, the uh, ruling party and the government uh, insisted that uh, the National Assembly should pass the four labor reform uh, bills, but it uh, could not be passed. Mm. And then the, uh, particularly uh, from the opposition parties, uh, there was strong suggestion, I mean, I mean, insist that the National Assembly should pass the special, several special law, revised version of the uh, several special law, but it could not be passed uh, at the uh, National Assembly. So I think the, uh, well, it's very regret, but we cannot say that the uh, uh, national, 19th National Assembly was the least productive one mm. comparing with the previous National Assemblies, mm. I think. So let me ask you, as we look ahead, what kind of changes uh, do you hope to see from the political circle um, under this spirit of cooperation? The first step that should be made by a political party is to keep their houses in order first before they reach out to work with the opposition parties. Uh, judging from the case of the failed emergency committee meeting uh, of the Senate party, the ruling the Conservative Party, mm. uh, then um, these political parties need to um, streamline their uh, personnel uh, in order before they try to engage with op other parties to work together uh, in the spirit of the cooperation and harmony uh, that they declared. Mm. Mm. What about you, Professor Shin? Well, I think the, uh, uh, the political parties uh, have thought the, uh, their political interest, I mean, their party's political interest rather than the national interests. I think it's too big a uh, big one to say, but I think the, they should have to change their attitude or uh, the etiquette or the, uh, uh, the principles in their mind as a politician 
that means they should put the uh, uh, first priorities on national, I mean, national interest rather than the, their own party's political interests. Mm. I think this can be the first step to get closer to the, uh, the politics of the collaboration and the harmony. That's a tall order, yes. <laughs> I would say. <laughs> now let's move on to our next topic of discussion. President Park Geun Hye is set to tour three African nations starting off in Ethiopia before heading to Uganda and Kenya to hold summit talks and establish a foundation for Korea to break into new markets. She will become Korea's first head of state to deliver a speech at the African Union headquarters where she will lay out Seoul's policy vision toward Africa. During the president's trip, a new collaborative development project called Korea Aid will be launched, bringing together the fields of healthcare, food, and culture through mobile services for local residents. The presidential office says it hopes to lend assistance for greater economic and social development in respective countries and open new doors of opportunities for Korean companies while winning over support on issues related to North Korea. President Park Geun-hye, for the first time since taking office, will head to the three African nations of Ethiopia, Uganda and Kenya this coming Wednesday. She is Korea's fourth head of state to visit Africa for summit diplomacy. We will discuss what significance this trip holds and what to expect. So these three countries are in East Africa, mm -hmm. to be specific. Why these three countries? What's worth noting about them? Well, the first of all, uh, when you look at the economic growth rate of these uh, countries, well, they are uh, higher than the European countries and even USA. They recorded the uh, uh, about 5% economic growth rates over the last uh, several years, which is very high. Mm -hmm. And then owing to the uh, faster economic uh, growth, uh, well, there have been some demands, uh, increasing demands for the uh, our new uh, shelters and new buildings and then uh, for the investment into uh, infrastructure, which means that these countries are emerging as one of the uh, blue oceans for the construction companies around the world. So this is very attractive, uh, the places for the construction uh, companies around the world. And if I tell, give you the data per year, uh, estimated the uh, demands for construction, uh, the projects is about $22 billion, which is very big. So uh, because of those kind of the, uh, 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 the aspects of these countries, as we know very well, Chinese leader Xi Jinping mm -hmm. and Japanese uh, Prime Minister also visited to these African countries. Well, as we uh, uh, know very well, President Park Geun-hye is planning to visit to these countries. So I think the, um, uh, the, uh, because of this kind of economic reasons, uh, these, countries, these countries are very important. And then also these countries have quite a huge potentiality as the future market because the, the population growth rate is also very high, these reasons. And then the, uh, our, the living conditions of these countries have been improved very rapidly. So because of this kind of reasons, definitely uh, uh, in the middle of the global financial crisis and economic difficulties, definitely uh, these countries' importance as a market uh, uh, seems to be uh, increasing very faster than our expectation. Mm -hmm. Well, in addition to Chinese President Xi Jinping, U.S. President Barack Obama recently visited Africa as well. Mm -hmm. From uh, the standpoint of diplomacy, why would you say this trip is important? This trip is very important in terms of South Korea setting its own foothold in the new frontier geopolitical competition between United States and China mm -hmm. in the new international relations era. Um, Africa has emerged as an area in which the projection of the United States as a reigning hegemonic power and that of China as a rising challenger uh, have been increasingly uh, manifested. Um, China has wasted no time uh, since early 2000s to put its own foothold in African countries as a benign hegemonic power, as an alternative, viable alternative to the United States and European countries. Chinese government allied with uh, African countries to create the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation, uh, FOCAC, uh, which is held every three years, um, back and forth, uh, between uh, Beijing and designated African country, member mm -hmm. country. And 
2006 was very important because for the first time, uh, it was upscaled as uh, summit meetings between the Chinese president, uh, Hu Jintao, at the time, and the head of the state of the Africa member states. And in 2006 uh, FOCAC meeting, uh, President Hu Jintao rolled out five billion uh, U.S. dollars uh, worth of concessionary loans to African countries during the summit. Mm -hmm. So it's like a dragon's gift mm -hmm. to African countries. Mm -hmm. And China has been taking good advantage of its premium. Uh, unlike European countries uh, that uh, carry the stigma of the colonial period mm. in the past, China's image is very benign and positive mm. in Africa as a very neutral, neutral uh, hegemony power. And uh, China has emerged just like uh, today's African country as an underdeveloped economy. So China projects the image of the bright future or the role model for these African countries. Mm. So better late than never for Better Korea. late than never. Mm -hmm. And South Korea can also emulate the practice of China, Chinese government by uh, highlighting the experience of South Korea as a country which achieved a, a miraculous economic recovery and development from the absolute poverty um, after the Korean War. Mm -hmm. now, during her trip, uh, the president will oversee the official launch of Korea's new assistance program called Korea Aid. Could you tell us more about that? This Korea Aid program uh, seems to be a very smart initiative, uh, tapping on the uh, South Korea's indigenous uh, mm -hmm. capital and experience. Uh, basically, the Korea Aid is a combination of healthcare, food, and pop culture to uh, go after the local uh, people in African countries. Mobile, they say. Mobile. Mm. They take advantage of the mobile uh, transportation uh, means to mm. uh, reach out to local people. So it's a very direct engagement of the African people, not necessarily going uh, through the uh, bureaucratic organizations. Mm. Um, so uh, mobile uh, transportation means uh, to provide basic health care and uh, uh, food culture and uh, display of the cultural products are expected to uh, enlarge uh, and engage uh, South Korea's uh, uh, pu public diplomacy to African countries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of ODA, Korea has been trying to increase its contribution to the world mm -hmm. and, and enhance its role in the world as well. So the government has committed $500 million um, in official development assistance to developing countries mm -hmm. by the year 2020. Uh, and a lot of that amount uh, is uh, expected to be earmarked for projects in Africa. These projects, they can in fact lead to economic gains for a country. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Well, I think the, uh, uh, we have to discuss about the, what economic relations is. Until so far, well, we checked it out. We have to analyze the trade volume and then cooperation in financial and physical sector. But the, uh, the force index emerged, that is the, how much the economic uh, cooperation has been uh, implemented in the form of ODA. Mm -hmm. So that much ODA becomes very important. So considering the importance of ODA as a way to strengthen the economic cooperation between or among countries, nations, definitely by providing more aid to a specific country, definitely the relations between two countries can be strengthened further. And then uh, owing to the aid, uh, the recipient country could achieve economic development when they are the, uh, do uh, conduct a project, definitely there the are high possibility uh, for them to having the, uh, the donor country to be a counterpart. But in this context, there must be a uh, high possibility uh, of be, I mean, giving some economic impact on the relations between two countries through ODA. But secondly, I think this is more important. There are two types of the ODA, tied and untied. Mm -hmm. Tied ODA means that I will provide something to you, but it will be provided the, uh, uh, by, with the uh, products made by my country and when you build a building, the, uh, the builder should be Korean company, something like that. I mean, uh, and the untied is no conditions. I mean, just, we just provided something to you. But the uh, particularly uh, still, I mean, desirable ODA should be 
untied mm. tie, but still many countries implement ODA in the form of tied. These uh, types of the uh, ODA has been very frequently used by the Japanese government. Very recently, Japanese government, Japanese companies could take the uh, so-called high-speed training project in India, which was a big one. And at the initial stage, that there were some the uh, report that this project will be in the hand of the French company, mm -hmm. but it was changed. Why? Because at the time, Prime Minister Abe, when he visited India, he offered a untied style aid. That means that out of total project cost, about 80 percent loans, which is will be a concessional loan, which is part of ODA. That means the uh, interest rate was a 0.1 percent, which is extremely low interest mm. rates. So, the by providing untied ODA to India, Japan could get that project. So what I'm saying is depending on the types of ODA, definitely the degree of economic impact on the relations between two countries, involving countries, can be determined. Mm. So there must be economic impact of the ODA on the relations between two countries. Mm. And ODA is often used as a tool for diplomacy as well. Right. I think to Professor Shin's analysis of uh, Japan's ODA policy in comparison with uh, South Korea's own, that uh, South Korea's ODA policy toward African countries needs a uh, to, to reconsider its uh, overall strategy uh, because at the end of the day, South Korea needs to uh, drastically increase its uh, sheer volume of ODA. Uh, the previous Imiyama government made a pledge that uh, South Korea would increase the, uh, its ODA in proportions to uh, you know, gross national income, but still South Korea's ODA uh, supply provision to the inter international society is uh, still hovering at the uh, 0.13 percent, mm. far lower than the average of the DAC uh, member countries, which is uh, 0.29 percent. So before we strategize uh, the specific aspects or the kinds of ODA uh, to be provided in the world, we need to focus on um, enlarging the absolute scale of the ODA to make a substantial impact in mm. actual practice. Mm. Well, we will follow up on developments from the president's trip next week. But for now, let's shift gears and turn to what appear to be tightening relations between the U.S. and Japan. Now, one of the first signs of closer U.S.-Japan ties mm -hmm. is President Barack Obama's planned visit to Hiroshima on May 27th. This is going to be a historic <laughs> visit, the first for a sitting U.S. president, and one that comes uh, 71 years after the U.S. dropped an atomic bomb on mm -hmm. the city. What do you think, uh, what kind of significance do you think his trip will bear? I think I want to pinpoint two or significance. The first one, um, as we know very well, Obama is almost finishing his term. Mm. And then during his uh, uh, two terms as President of the United States, he has achieved a huge diplomatic achievements. The first one is he initiated the uh, nuclear summits, and he uh, finished the uh, nuclear crisis in Iran, and he normalized the diplomatic relations with Cuba. But I think on the top of these achievements, he won't add it up one more, I think, uh, by visiting Hiroshima. Maybe he wants to empathize the importance of denuclearization to the global community. Mm. So I think uh, this can be one of the significance we can pinpoint from his visit to Hiroshima. And second one, I think this is more important. As you know very well in the reason, I mean the past big, I mean the past big, there are uh, an severe competition between uh, USA and, and mainland China. Uh, to take the initiatives or hegemony power in, in the reason. And then for the USA, definitely, Japan is very important to uh, achieve this goal. According to the reports, Japanese government, particularly Prime Minister Abe, has insisted, uh, asked the USA government and the President Obama personally to uh, visit to Hiroshima. I think this can be very helpful for Prime Minister Abe to maintain his popularity among the uh, Japanese people. So definitely in, to maintain uh, I mean, to the relation, close relationship between two countries and you know, as a token of the appreciation, as a, as a token of the uh, friendship between two countries, uh, Mr. Obama may uh, maybe accept his uh, invitation. Mm. I think this can be a second significance. Well, one concern that's been raised is that uh, President Obama's uh, visit to Hiroshima might transform Japan's image from that uh, uh, of an aggressor to a victim of war. What do you think? 
I personally think that uh, our risk is relatively low, lower than um, you know, feared by uh, China and South Korea. And the United States has been you know, extremely uh, concerned about uh, this, this, this worry expressed by especially uh, its ally in South Korea. It was reported by one of the major Korean newspapers uh, that the United States government has been engaging in steady and consistent communication with the South Korean government about the level of the message that uh, President Obama would deliver uh, if he was ever going to uh, make a visit to Hiroshima mm -hmm. uh, with the South Korean government. So the uh, United States government has been doing its best uh, in order to accommodate uh, South Korean government's concern and request uh, prior to making the official announcement about this scheduled visit to Hiroshima. Mm -hmm. So I don't think there will be any uh, surprising uh, announcement or uh, diplomatic act uh, made by U.S. President Obama in Hiroshima. After all, the key word uh, for President Obama's visit to Hiroshima is uh, the nuclear, uh, to help create a world uh, free of nuclear weapons. Mm. And the White House uh, delivered the official uh, announcement that the highlight of this uh, visit is to uh, express the President's continued commitment to pursuing the peace and security of a world without nuclear weapons and to honor the memory of all innocents, not just the Japanese victims, but all, all innocents, regardless of the nationality, who, who were lost during the war. So if the Japanese media or the government try to uh, take a spin to portray this visit as the U.S. government officially admitting its uh, wrongdoings and deliver apology for the two atomic bombs dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki mm -hmm. uh, during the Pacific War, then pressure will be on the shoulders of the Prime Minister Abe, then the domestic opinion in the United States will be very hostile that why the uh, United States uh, would have you know, needed to deliver the apology when it was clear that Japan was the aggressor that started the Pacific War mm -hmm. by invading uh, the Pearl Harbor. Then the Prime Minister Abe uh, would feel tremendous pressure not only from home, but also from the United States to make a, a return visit to Pearl Harbor to, you know, express uh, Japan's own, own apology mm -hmm. for the Pacific War. When we visit Hiroshima, there is a museum. They just uh, show us the uh, disaster, I mean, outcomes uh, of the I mean, nuclear bombing. So they said that so young guys and small children cried and uh, had a burn. Uh, injury because of the nuclear bombs, but they did not tell why the uh, USA mm. uh, I mean, uh, dropped, the, dropped bomb. the, bombs. the bombs. And then certainly there are some implications. When you get the message between the lines, that is that we are the victims of the war, seems like that. But on the part of the USA, definitely it's not true. USA did not uh, like it doing um, um, drop the bombing, uh, the Hiroshima, but it was needed to Stop and the, the war, war right? stop the mm -hmm. war. So I think there is some equations that exist between two countries. But during the uh, Obama's official visit to Hiroshima, must, uh, there must be, uh, I mean, the, uh, they do not touch this area deliberately. Right. Another uh, area of responsibility uh, that is fallen in, in, in the Japanese government is to clarify that all the victims were not only Japanese, but mm. at least 10% of the uh, victims who died in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, out of uh, about approximately 220,000 deaths in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, about 10%, approximately 30,000 uh, deaths were Korean nationals. Uh -huh. So mm. it, it is not just a tragedy for Japanese people, but it's a tragedy of all innocents, mm. a victim of the war. So. Mm. If Japanese government want to uh, rectify the historical record uh, by objective standards, then the narrative of the Japanese government should include the non-Japanese victims as well. Mm. Mm. So is it ultimately China that is driving these already close allies to become even closer? Well, in the reason, uh, the Chinese government, uh, well, as I explained before, they have made every effort to take the initiatives they proposed to establishment of AIIB, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. 
In, in response to those kind of Chinese proposal, USA has uh, took the initiatives in an effort to establish the TPP. And certainly in the economic sector, there must be severe competition in various forms. And how about in the uh, security and political uh, the arena? Definitely by spending, stepping up the uh, uh, USA-Japan defense agreement, definitely uh, the USA and Japan reconfirm how close they are. And then the, I mean the, uh, about the third deployment in the Korean Peninsula, there has been some hot debate and hot discussions between USA and China. Of course, we were involved in the discussion as well. But definitely, uh, we can say that there has been severe competition between two countries to take the hegemony power. So, uh, the, you know, uh, in the past, Japan was a counterpart uh, for the USA government in an effort to take the hegemony power, but definitely it was changed. I mean, the China became the target country. So, the collaboration with Japan seems to be very, very important for the USA. USA just tried to do everything in some sense which they can do uh, to strengthen the relationship with Japan. I think in this context, we have to understand the, uh, uh, the uh, policies or the uh, measures taken by USA and China. Mm. Now, some have called this a new honeymoon period for Washington and Tokyo. Where does that leave Korea? Are we the third wheel? Well, um, if uh, South Korea gets invitations to join the celebration of honeymoon, I don't think there is no strong reason for South Korea to reject it. Uh, because uh, enhancement of trilateral security cooperation among U.S., Japan, and South Korea not only serve the interest of the United States and Japan, but also South Korea mm -hmm. facing real threat uh, from North Korea with nuclear weapons and long-range missiles. And we also take into account the uh, implications of the rising military power of China in Northeast Asia. I think uh, it is part of the uh, grand U.S. strategy uh, to designate uh, key security partners in a given region in order to relieve uh, the burden of the security commitment that has been tremendously expanded during the George W. Bush era, during the era of the global war against terrorism. So this uh, trend is likely to continue, uh, largely depending upon who will be the next president of the United States. Mm -hmm. but. Uh, Mr. Donald Trump of the Republican Party has already begun to speak of leaving the security of our allies as a responsibility of themselves. So if the trend continues, then the uh, you know, policy of the United States to try to ask the, its uh, allies in Asia to assume uh, additional security burden is likely to continue. And Japan has uh, every reason to welcome that. Mm -hmm. uh, in the name of justifying the expansion of the role of self-defense mm -hmm. forces under the principle of exercising the right to collective self-defense. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of win-win situation for the United States and Japan. So Japan is likely to accept the, a request from the United States, especially after the President Obama's, Obama's view to Hiroshima uh, will help uh, remove the obstacle of historical antagonisms left from the era of the Pacific War. Mm. Then Japan is going to try to assume more a role in regional security affairs uh, by accepting more responsibility uh, requested by the United States. Mm. Well, we have to wrap up our discussion. Any last words before we go? Well, I think this is the uh, very important moment uh, in Korean politics. I think uh, after the 20th uh, general, general election, the, uh, all the political parties uh, empathize the needs of the, the politics of collaboration, cooperation and harmony. I think so. I want to give them uh, this, uh, the, uh, all the saying, the well beginning is half done. So mm -hmm. I, want, I want them to keep this uh, saying in their mind and then I hope they can have a very successful start. Hoping the new yeah. National Assembly yeah. embarks yes. on a good note. Okay, Dr. Fong? May reminds the South Korean people of a very uh, difficult and tragic memory of the Gwangju uh, democratization movement in mm -hmm. 1980. But at the same time, it will provide a moment to remind us that South Korea is the only country that has achieved not only economic development, but also political mm -hmm. liberalization. So we have to uh, keep both uh, the uh, dark side and the positive side of history uh, to think about 
uh, what we have achieved and how to maintain that. Well, thank you two very much for sharing your thoughts with us today. That is all for this edition of News Inside. Thanks for watching. We'll be back with more next week.